Great. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Aslam Fatah. I'm standing in, uh, hopefully if only for a while, uh, for the uh, chairperson of the session, Professor Azim Badruddin. He may be joining us within the next moment or two, but until then, I will be doing the honors. Thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon, colleagues. Um, we have about uh, 100 people um, uh, registered for this webinar, so welcome to all of you. Um, the book that we are celebrating is by none other than Professor Peter Calloway, and the book's title is The Changing Face of Colonial Education in Africa. The book is published by African Sun Media, uh, based at Stellenbosch, and um, they are also the hosts of this particular webinar. The way in which the webinar will be running is that Professor Calloway will be addressing, speaking about the book for about 20 minutes or so. Um, he'll take us through the book, he'll uh, present us some of the key issues and so on. And then it will be um, uh, that his uh, presentation will be followed by two discussants presentations. One, which is Dr. Sean, Sean Morrow, who uh, just uh, indicated to me that he is currently living in, uh, in Pretoria. Um, and I will follow him. Uh, I am based at Stellenbosch University. Without any further ado, it is now about two minutes past four, so I will call on Professor Calloway to speak to us about his book. Professor Calloway, over to you. Um, thank you, Aslam. You can go ahead, Professor, we can hear you. Oh, can you can you see me? Because I'm, 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 yes. I'm... Okay, great. Thank you, Aslam. And uh, uh, I, I, I need to just begin by saying thank you um, to Routledge, Taylor and Francis for the original uh, uh, a, a publication of this book and then, and then uh, uh, African Sun Media uh, for, 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 for making possible uh, a South African edition to that. I'm very grateful to Vickers and to Michelle for that. And I also just need to say thank you to UCT, UWC, Stellenbosch, the NRF for making this research possible over the years for facilitating. And I also need to say thank you to Azim and to, 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 to Aslam and to Maureen Robinson and to Crane Sadin for pitching in and, happy and, 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 and financially enabling this to happen because uh, that was necessary at one stage. So uh, thank you to them. And thanks to Aslam, Sean, and hopefully Azim for being here today. Uh, this has been a very taxing business. Trying to, what is this book about anyway? I've been asking myself this for, <laughs> for some time. What exactly is this about? And I, the starting point seems to me to say, um, we've all been to school. We've all had children. We've uh, maybe even grandchildren at school. We all know things about school. We all have opinions about education, whether we like it or not. We've all um, had associations with schools and colleges. We all have opinions about how schools should be run or what they should teach or what the teachers should be doing or how the teachers should be taught, whatever. We all have these opinions. They are part of our um, world we live in, in, in all sorts of ways. And that, that in itself is a, is a, is a, is a very important um, an issue. Um, that isn't just come out of nowhere. It's part of a, a two centuries phenomenon, uh, secular education, formal education of the kind that, that we uh, are talking about here. Um, so it's existed for the better part of two centuries. And how has it been conceived? How, how has it been uh, uh, constructed over a long period of time by many, many people. And I suppose the point uh, that lies at the bottom of everything I'm saying is that this is a process, a phenomenon that is 
fraught with complexities, ambiguities, multi-dimensionalities that uh, we seldom think about. We seldom, we often just take for granted what is in front of us. And this book in his attempt to engage with that background in a way. It's to engage with that background specifically in relation to the changing landscape of colonial education in Africa and South Africa in the mid years of the 20th century. In other words, in the years prior to apartheid, uh, prior to the post-war independence era. And so in a way, what I'm looking at is what was the base upon which the national education systems of Africa were based in the post-war era. And of course, in contrast, what was the base on which in the South African context, apartheid education was built? Uh, it's often those are seen as totally different things. Uh, uh, but I, I think the more we look and the more this book, <clears throat> uh, the more I dug into this book, the more I realized, of course, that that is not that is not entirely so. And, and so what, what, what we have here is something like an attempt. I, in the past, have done most of my work on apartheid education and South Africa and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the recent period. Um, but this is an attempt to read back, as it were, South African history into the history of colonial Africa. I suppose that's, that's the key point I have here. That uh, uh, the, and and through education, through through the lens of education and education policy, um, and of course my hope is, and I'll come to that in a minute. My hope is that uh, in looking at that phenomenon in a, in a global context, because obviously educational change was happening globally at the same time. Um, that we can read African history, African educational history, South African educational history into a global into a global context. So, if my book helps you to grapple with those complicated issues, and they are complicated issues, then 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 I will have had some success because all of us uh, here, Sean, um, Azim. Um, uh, Aslam, we have all spent a good deal of our lives training teachers and research people in the field of education. And one of the things that seems to me that we often miss, uh, or that we have tried to induct into students over the years through teaching and research, has been that you can't actually understand what goes on in South Africa without understanding what went on elsewhere in Africa, but also what was going on in the world in the first half of the 20th century in education. Not a simple set of questions, which we, which, which we know well. They're trying to teach that stuff to teachers is not easy. So what's the book about? <clears throat> This book that has flowed out of our research, our supervision, etc. It is essentially that reading South African history, not seeing South African educational history, apartheid education, Bantu education as something unique, but something that is one strand of what was going on, not only in South Africa, not only in Africa, but in India, Latin America, whatever, North America, etc. And in particular, I want to try to read or well, what I've done is to try to read that colonial education in the interwar war year as against the context of post-World War I world, the depression, the rise of communism and fascism, and particularly in our context, the rise of African nationalism. How did African nationalism impact on education? How did education impact on African nationalism? Not only that, but I also think, and I'll come back to that a little later, is that although history doesn't provide a blueprint for educational policy in the present or in the future, it does help us to see 
some of the fabric in which that policy is created or has been created. And so to reflect on what is wrong today or what is right today, we might do well to look back at where we've come from. Because somehow or other, we never seem to look beyond 1948 when we're looking backwards to see where we've come from. So I'd like to start off by just saying something about the relevance of history, because I can't get away from that um, in this. It is, a, it is a history book, fundamentally. And one of my favorite historians is Tony Judd, who um, wrote this a few years ago. And I, I, I've come back to this quote over and over again, because I think it sums up a lot about the world we live in. Out of all the contemporary illusions, he argues, the most dangerous is the one that underpins and accounts for all the others. And that is the idea that we live in a time without precedent, that was ha what is happening to us now is new and irreversible, and the past has nothing to teach us, out of his reflections on the history of the 20th century. And my response or my, 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 my attempt to engage with that issue is to, again, I quote from my own book, the relevance of historical research for an explanation of the roots of contemporary education policy and its relation to uh, relationship to notions of equity, democracy, development has been sadly rejected in recent years. And, and you could say much of the work of the United of of the World Bank or the or UNESCO uh, has has bypassed them. This not looking at history means that policy makers have forfeited the advantages of reflecting on the rhetoric and reality, the traditions and experience of past endeavors, and examining them critically for potential understandings of present and future policy making. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's, that's my space. The goal of this book is to attempt ambitiously to try to understand that legacy that from the world of the interwar era, that legacy of educational planning and development, which remember didn't really exist in the colonial context um, uh, in, in the form that we know it now in that time. It was being constructed. It was being constructed at that stage in the first half of the 20th century. It was being constructed internationally, but particularly in the colonial world, it was in a very embryonic stage. So South Africa, Africa, the world, the writing of the history of South Africa into a wider framework of global educational reform and policy and practice and writing Africa, South Africa into the African script. An ambitious task, and and I I don't know. I you know I battled for a long time, and I can see all sorts of limitations, shortages, whatever. On what do you build such a story? Well, the archive has a multiplicity of resource, of sources. Yeah, they come from missionary archives, state and colonial archives. Foundation, American Foundation archives, university archives, private papers of educationalists who were based, all those based in the UK or in Germany that I've looked at, UK, Germany, USA and South Africa. I haven't really looked at France uh, to any large extent. So a lot of time and work, a geograph and, and, and the geographical scope of that, that well, it stretches from my little modest village in the Eastern Cape, which I write into the script, uh, through to the great centers of colonialism in Berlin, Paris, London, New York. One of the things that is missing from an exploration of colonial Africa in East, West, Southern Africa, the South of America, colonial India, one of the big things that is missing, particularly in the African context, is African voices. 
because none of those archives that I have uh, outlined, none of those archives really give voice to, for, for all obvious reasons, to what Africans thought about all this, different groups of Africans, etc. So as a corrective in this book, the last two chapters deal with two South Africans who I've managed to identify as having some kind of impact, some kind of influence on the story, some of people who were written in to the big global story through tiny, tiny incremental um, 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 interventions on their part. One was Donald Nkunkulu, and the other was Samuel Nkai, a uh, Eastern Cape uh, uh, was an activist. Both products of Lovedale at one stage or another. So I won't say more about that now, but the book is balanced between an international global context which, that is, focuses on missionaries because they were the people who did most of the job from the 19th century into the 20th century uh, when it came to what was called native education. Um, to, 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 to the colonial, various colonial uh, uh, authorities and individuals, um, to uh, uh, humanitarian organizations from, from the Carnegie Corporation to the Philip Stokes Organization to the South African Institute of Race Relations in South Africa and so on. So a whole variety there. Looking backwards, very briefly here, but I, I hope the book speaks to this as well. And that is that over the past few years, there's been a lot of debate about colonial education, a, a lot of heated debate about colonial education, about how, about the, the downside of it all. And I suppose what I'm in muddying the water here, in, in, in trying to um, uh, demonstrate the multi-perspectivity of this is to say that this has to be looked at from a range of perspectives. Um, what does the, millennial, the, the, the millennial generation think of missionary education um, and the heritage of that generation? And if you have to, to, to put that to just in one word, what did the, gener the Mandela generation think of it? There's, it? there's very, very different perspectives on this. So what are we to make of the colonial forms of education? Mission schools, colonial curricula, what was their legacy? How did African, Africans of various kinds and in various spaces, and remember, Africans cannot be generically kind of identified here, how did they react? to missionary education, colonial education. And what were the debates between educators about those changes? And, 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 and the whole point of my story is that missionary education, I mean, colonial education, come missionary education wasn't static. We were not talking about one thing. We're talking about, in the, particularly in the period I'm talking about, a, a lively set of debates going on in the colonial office, in, in the foundations and in government about what it was that native education was supposed to be. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So once again, the complexities, the ambiguities, the multidimensionalities. Um, what was it to educate people for citizenship? What was it to educate people for work? What is it? What was the relationship between education and culture? Those are questions that were not just raised in Africa. They were, they, they, they were global questions. And they were picked up by progressive educationalists of all kinds, uh, but particularly in the United States. But, but uh, that uh, ramifications of progressive education um, 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 uh, 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 emerge in Africa uh, in the whole debate about adapted education, which I'll come to in a minute. So what were colonial schools for? I suppose that's one question that, that I want to put here. What were colonial schools for? 
And Brian Mun Mumford, who was a lecturer at the Institute of Education in their colonial education department in 1935, put it, I thought, extremely well. Although both Europeans and natives are pressing for more facilities, they desire them for very different and mutually antagonistic reasons. The white man or the colonizer desires native education in order to train human tools for his economic and administrative machine and to make more efficient servants of the natives. Whereas the natives desire the same order, the same education in order that they might attain equality with or even challenge the white man in his own sphere. So, you know, it isn't as if all this was some kind of mystery in 1935. Although, admittedly, that kind of that kind of re response from 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 Mumford is 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 a bit unusual, I have to say. <clears throat> I'll come back to somebody else called um, <coughs> Victor Murray, who was a um, extremely enlightened commentator on all of this. So then, I want to just skip to what was the debate about colonial education. What, what were people going on about in this Well, in the literature, and in to the 20th century. <laughs> that education in the 19th century, because it kept a classical European, was, it, it was a curriculum that, that focused on the rural context, that was adapted to African rural needs. It's aggregate, um, suitable to a lifestyle, work and life in the countryside because Africans were seen to be another variation of that particular um, uh, uh, came essentially from German missionaries, <clears throat> and that was about adapting the education to the cultural and language. In other words, on the basis of progressive education, um, going from the known to the unknown, it was thought that what was, <coughs> excuse me, appropriate education was an education which would prevent the breakdown of the trauma. Would, would encourage people to stay in the countryside, all in a context where their labor was being needed against that view, against that view. There was the view that <coughs> the schools should prepare Africans for the modern world, that, um, that there was no point in this kind of education which simply reinvented the colonial man. And there again, I want, <coughs> excuse me, no, sorry, to, to quote Victor Murray, who's, as I said, somebody wrote, The School in the Bush um, in 1929, the most wonderful book about African education, perhaps the only critical book about it. He, he argues, if it is recognized that education was part of a social structure, it is patently observed to educate people to till the soil if the conditions of land tenure make it impossible for such labor to end up anywhere else other than with itself. It is part of a non-moral attitude to education induced by modern scientific method, in other words, the adaptation of school, <coughs> to ignore this challenge. And, <coughs> excuse me, under the old system, of literary education, 
It was forgotten that men had (coughs) bodies to feed and clothe. Under the new system, it may may be forgotten that they had minds to feed and spirits to kindle. Differentiation without equality means permanent inferiority for the black man. Their education is in vain unless they seek also to bring about social injustice through which the educated native may be acknowledged as a citizen of his own country. Now that is extremely modern. And that was written in 19, before 1929. So many Africans, particularly West Africa, but <coughs> of the Mandela generation as well, would have agreed with that. That they wanted the same education that you got in, in, in England or in, in Germany or in America. They wanted the same thing. The problem with that was, and that was that was widely held view of the new literate group crowd um, of the Mandela generation. The problem was, of course, language. So you had to factor in the fact that people spoke other languages. And that, again, all I'm doing is showing you or trying to demonstrate (coughs) the complexity of the debate. But I can also show you where apartheid education comes from. It's part of that mainstream, in a way. It comes out of German missionary um, Iceland was a was a was a Berlin missionary of a Berlin missionary family, so so it's not surprising that this comes there. And so there are there are two streams, as it were, are there, which uh, maybe I'm not being entirely as clear as I could. But I've, but Murray, in a sense, says same, and and many of the new intellectual elite of of, of, the, of the mission school products all argued in favor of the same education. Uh, what you did in primary school, of course, was a different story because of the language issue. What I'm trying to say, and I'll stop right now, is that there's a, there's a tenuous link between colonial education in the rest of Africa and apartheid education in South Africa. But we need to be very careful about the nature of that relationship and 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 whether we see um, them as or in what ways we see them as similar. Final word. I'd like to suggest that these aren't arcane historical issues and debates. They have direct relevance to the understanding of social policy in the post-war period, because many of these ideas were picked up. Uh, in the reconstruction of Africa uh, uh, after World War II. And they also were picked up in the South African context, both by those who supported apartheid and those who opposed it. So we swam, we all swam in that stream uh, of of discourse that was engendered in this period um, um, between the wars. So as a final word, I can just say, I hope that this assists you, assists us to grapple anew with these incredibly important issues at the center of our society at a time when we are battling, when our education system is battling for credibility and when our society is in grave crisis as the election has just demonstrated to us. And education is one of the key aspects of that crisis. So I would like to invite a discussion around those issues and, and, and to encourage more research in the, and to follow up on what I've tried to lay on the table. Thank you, Asla. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, my, Thanks, apologies, my apologies to you for um, coming in at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to the introductions again. I think we should just move on. And thank you for your um, overview of key ideas. I think uh, there are some things that we are going to want to pick up on. Um, so just in terms of the, our audience, if our audience can simply, um, if they have something to say, to put the comments in the chat, in the chat, 
and then I can pick up on the uh, on the chat and and raise them as questions once once we've heard Sean speak and once we've heard um, Aslam speak. Okay, thanks. So it's always strange to come in at the back end and, and introduce people um, because um, we're never quite sure what has been said. I'll come back to Peter in a minute because Peter is my uh, my mentor, my intellectual guide, my um, someone that I've worked with and worked with his work over a period of 20 odd years. So uh, the questions that I want to raise, but also things that I want to say that is tied to the contribution uh, of Peter through his books over a, a very long time. But I think what is important to do first is to go to our contributors today, um, Dr. Sean Morrow firstly, uh, who is a historian and editor, uh, who studied at Trinity College in Dublin and also at the University of Sussex. Um, uh, I, for everybody that knows Sean, uh, Sean has taught at schools and universities in Ireland, Zambia, Malawi, Lesotho and South Africa. A true, South Af a true African, um, in sense, Africa has grown in his blood in a sense. Uh, he's published on aspects of the educational, the religious, cultural, the liberation history of Central and South uh, uh, of Central Africa and South Africa, and his recent work includes a biography of the South African anthropologist Monica Wilson. Um, from work that I've done with Sean, uh, Sean's a biographer of note, and so his interest in biography has continued with his current work on the on the Bam family in the Eastern Cape. I think what Sean's going to do for us today is to engage with Peter's book as a work of history, as a work of history in Africa, uh, as a work um, tied to empire and tied to um, colonialism and apartheid. And so I'll, I'll, I'll now shift to Sean um, to give some input on, on Peter's book. Thank you. Well, thanks Azim. Um, uh, for that introduction, and thanks, Pete, for the very eloquent uh, presentation about the book. Uh, yes, try, trying to talk about this as a historian, of course, what else would I do? And of course, what that means is that I will be set, perhaps only re-emphasizing things that Peter has said already, but I think there are things that are worth re-emphasizing, at least I hope so. You know, when I first heard about this uh, project that uh, Peter was embarking on, Pete was embarking on, I couldn't help thinking about a sort of history of education, another trudge through, um, you know, up, an updated Malerba, if those who know the book, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing like that. It's a far more interesting book, uh, not at all a sort of a, <laughs> that trudge, as I say. Um, vivid perspectives on the first half of the uh, 20th century, and I'll say very few things because I haven't got much time uh, about that as I as I go on. The focus on conferences, it's a very clever way of uh, trying to put some form on that crucial period in South Africa, not just South Africa, though, African educational history, and much wider than, that's one of the many merits of this book, is that it doesn't treat education in that, that boxed off way. It, it leads out of education into all sorts of other uh, spheres rather than limiting it. And that, of course, is uh, uh, says a lot about education as well, working back that way. Uh, missionaries, their networks, civil servants and all the rest of it. Um, and also these two very interesting and quite long chapters uh, at the end of the book on Tim Kulu and Tim Pai. Uh, I think they are, they really interested me, those two chapters. I wouldn't say they were more interesting than the others, but they are particularly interesting, I think. Look, another thing, speaking again as a historian, that is, this book is methodologically a very imaginative book. Uh, quite often, and especially in those two last chapters, uh, Pete is working with quite difficult material, absence of material, sketchy material, and I think he does a triumphantly good job on that. He makes a story, uh, an informative story, out of stuff seized from here and there, oral interviews, 
um, odd references here and there. Uh, not that Ntimkulu, for example, is absent from the record, especially when he leaves South Africa, but he is, I think, I think Pete found him a difficult fellow to grasp. And I think he has done this really wonderfully. Um, the, look, another thing about this book um, is that it is, yes, it's about South Africa to quite a large extent, but it looks, again, it looks outwards. It looks at the empire of the time, the British empire. Um, it looks at India. Um, and also, I mean, it's not something that is very overtly uh, explored. Why would it be? There's lots and lots of material on it, but underlying it is British education as well, I think. Um, you know, the, the, that's where the, at least the British missionaries came from. And I, I, anyway, I hope I'm right in this. I sensed that awareness of not just of the intellectuals of the educational world, but also of the reality of schooling in, the, in Britain. Um, and I think that is another huge uh, um, strong point of, the, of, of, of this book. Um, the, so, you know, this I think is South African history as it, oh gosh, this is an arrogant thing to say, but I think it is South African history as it should be written. Uh, in other words, not that rather, of course, I'm not pointing any fingers and neither am I saying that this is a general tendency, but there is, I think, a tendency for obvious and uh, understandable reasons of a sort of claustrophobic, uh, you know, South African historiography, which again, went back to Pete's, uh, to use this word, I can't remember, but exceptionalism, you know, South Africa is something particular. Of course, South Africa as everywhere is somewhere particular, but it's not as particular as it sometimes thinks it is, or some people in South Africa thinks it is. And uh, that is one of the great merits of this book. It's, uh, it, 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 it is taking, it is um, eating away at that exceptionalism, if you like. Um, it's open to Africa and to the world indeed. Um, therefore, for example, one of the chapters, they're all fascinating, but one of the chapters that's particularly interesting, I thought, is the, uh, is the chapter on Diedrich Westermann, um, the uh, German linguist. I mean, that, it's both, a, a, again, it shows the, the, the way in which even the British Empire was not a single thing. It was, it was all sorts of cross-cutting things. Uh, as Pete says, France doesn't appear much in this. There's, that's a whole other story, but Germany does. And that is... Uh, very interesting. And of course, v Westermann's particular personal history is rather tragic, really. I'm getting um, from this uh, British-German collaborative efforts to the storm of Nazism and the World Second World War and impoverishment after the war. I don't mean to uh, make him out to be a total hero, wh which of us is, but he, but he, uh, he made far too many compromises with, with uh, the, the National Socialist regime, but there he was. And it's a fascinating story that Pete tells about him uh, um, and again, demonstrates this outward lookingness of his, of his, of his history. Um, so, you know, we, get, we have this story of these colonial educators, the anthropologists, the missionaries, the civil servants. The impression I get actually I mean, you can say that they were, and again, it would be uh, sometimes too too arrogant, really, to say that these to 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 too arrogant of us to accuse them always of being arrogant and culturally sort of superior. They were, yeah, that's true, but they were anxious as well. I, I got that feeling of anxiety from what Pete is talking about. Um, what's happening? You know, um, uh, where are we going? Debating implementing colonial education, complex thing, complexities which obviously we still live with today. And as I say, the uh, involvement, <coughs> the, the, the marginal, in fact, hardly any involvement of the African protagonists in this, the two chapters that he, 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 gives, us, he gives us, um, I suppose you could say that Ntinkulu was on, involved to some extent, uh, and Kai hardly at all, um, though a very important figure, I know, in Kosa uh, 
literature and so on. Um, that, that's, we could say a lot more about that, the steward readers and the, the production of textbooks and readers. I mean, that is incredibly important because it's what actually African kids were exposed to uh, when they were um, you know, in, in the classroom. And as Pete says, I mean, the, this underlying rhythm of a lot of this uh, is the debate uh, between the academic education and practical education. There are many different names for it, um, for, for this. And it continues still. I mean, it's, it's, there are many debates, but they all, I think, rest on this, um, uh, controversy is the wrong word, on, on this duality between these two approaches to education. But as I say, I won't, I'll only spend another minute or two. Um, Pete's the great strength, many of, one of the many great strengths of this book is its, is its refusal to oversimplify, uh, to, to always look at the context, um, to look at the actual situation that people were in. Tim Kula, for example, a moderate sort of man, but he varied in his uh, in the way he approached the educational issues of his day. And you could understand that. That isn't in, it's okay, it's inconsistency if you like, but it is much more a reflection of the complexities of the time. Complex, the sort of complexities we still have, I think. So that I think is the, really it lies behind this book. And one final thing, uh, which uh, Pete mentioned, but I'd like to um, stress if you like. Um, the introductory, pages, few pages about his own uh, family and upbringing in, as he said, in Berlin, small Dorpy in the Eastern Cape um, and his youth and his becoming aware of the world, heaven help us, through the, uh, through the being exposed to the, uh, the brother who taught him, the Catholic brother who taught him in school in East London. Um, not, you would think, the, the most uh, you know, most outward looking and, uh, but in that context it was. And again, it's a question of context. It's a question of where you come from, you know, and I really like that. It was, um, and again, one, one is sometimes told to look at the historian before you look at the history. It was Yej Kara, one of these guys, maybe to some extent, but whether you should do that or not, in this case, uh, Pete's description of his background at that time um, his social democratic father, uh, you know, um, Rhodes University and the widening intellectual world, a lovely few pages and very, very good introduction to reading the book as a whole. Uh, so it's a fine book, it's an imaginative book. Um, it always questions things that are simplistic or ahistorical. It uh, certainly makes one think again about the developmentalism that our, you know, the post Second World War and into our own time, uh, the ahistoricism of that, of those approaches who think that they are making a new world from nothing, uh, when in fact this book demonstrates they, if they don't look at what happened in the past, they, uh, some people don't look at what happened in the past, uh, they will never really, how could they make sense of the present and where they're hoping to go? So I think this is. A very nice book. I'm very, very glad that uh, um, the press has is publishing publishing it, publishing it in South Africa, um, so that it doesn't cost hundreds and hundreds of rand from from somewhere else. Um, it's, I think, a much more important book. Education is vitally important, but this is even more important because it opens our eyes to all sorts of things, including stemming from, uh, but much wider than even education by itself. So Pete, thanks very much. And uh, as I should have said at the beginning, thanks very much for that introduction. Very good to see you all, by the way, and to think of all these people out there listening to this. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Um, I, in, in fact, I haven't seen Sean for, uh, for more than 10 years, I think. So great, really great to listen to you again, Sean. Um, Asla will now uh, uh, provide insights into, in, into the discussion as well. Uh, let me introduce Aslam. Aslam is a distinguished professor in sociology of education at Stellenbosch University. Um, he currently holds a research and development chair in the university's transformation office. And uh, he's a former president of the South African uh, Education Association, a research association, and also the uh, 
an editor in chief of the of South African Review of Education uh, in between two, uh, 2009 and 2015. Um, Aslam is also widely published um, and has written a number of books tied to what he's going to do to, uh, to speak about today in terms of his response to Peter's work. He's written on education policy reform in South Africa. He's written on student subjectivities, and that's something that we 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 don't really engage with in terms of colonial histories. How do where's the subject in all of this? And then he's also uh, worked intensively on educational practices and pathways of students across um, power marginalized regions. Um, so, for uh, if I may introduce Aslam. Uh, Aslam is also, besides a, a friend that we've come a long way alongside uh, working with each other, um, we've also worked alongside Peter. And so Aslam brings a personal uh, dimension to um, to his input on the book today, as 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 friends, as colleagues, as as fellow travelers um, in our discussions on South African history. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you very much, Azim. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, yes, I will, for the, my, my first couple of comments will be a little bit personal, and then I will give a little bit of my understanding of the summary of the, the text and one or two comments after that. Um, I would like to offer these comments in honor of a book and a life. Peter, if I may say so, you will be 80 years old on the 16th of June, 2022. I'm correct, I think. Why am I correct? Because we used to celebrate that with Peter uh, over many, many years. That the idea of this book therefore has a very profound social provenance, provenance for me and for Sean and for Peter and for Andrew Patterson, whom I see on the webinar, and for uh, uh, Maureen Robinson and Crane Sodin and so on and so forth. But my first interaction with Peter was via his work by his books as a youth activist in the 1980s, primarily via two texts. His, uh, the first one was his seminal text, Education and Apartheid, uh, The Education of Black South Africans. When you scholar Google its citations, you will see how many citations that particular book has. And the second text was me as a history teacher using his History Alive school textbook series published by Shooter and Suter in 1987. Literally uh, rope learning it and teaching it as gospel to my grade, uh, grade 11 standard nine students about uh, the industrial revolutions and the discovery of mineral and diamonds and so on and so forth. We experienced, Peter, these texts as exhilarating and galvanizing. It's not an overstatement. We read it as such. The Texas material uh, analysis of the social reproductive functioning of education in relation to the racial capitalist class structures of colonial and apartheid society gave us a very, very powerful language to match our anti-aspirational political commitments. Peter's books over the years, especially uh, his work on the politics and policies of education, gave me and sort of an educational sense-making language in my early academic years. Sort of a kind of an architecture to organize my thinking um, as a progressive anti-apartheid education academic located at what was then called the University of the Left, the University of the Western Cape, where both of us started in 19, uh, 19, 1994 as academics, me as a junior lecturer and Peter Calloway as a full professor. So you can imagine the mentoring and the friendship relationship that we had. But at UWC, uh, we were exposed to Peter as a gentle person. Karon Canal is uh, on this uh, chat as well. And I asked her, I think just before I was I started my work uh, about Peter, and she told me Peter, Peter might have a, a great struggle intellectual reputation, but he is a gentle and a caring person and you don't have to fear him when you work with him and it was much, that was a truism that was more true than what Caron in, uh, told me at that point. At UWC in the 1990s we learned from his lecturing pedagogy so Peter gave a course called Education in South Africa it was a history and sociology and politics course 
And he had a team of tutors, which I was one, Azim was one, and so on. And he involved us in the design of the course. So we could argue with him about the design, what should be read, what shouldn't. And also in the pedagogical uh, exposition, in other words, how, how was he going to teach the course? What was the job of, tut of the tutors? How were we to approach the uh, you know, uh, sense-making explanations and the assessments and so on and so forth? That was a rich school uh, from which I gained a valuable lifelong experience about how to organize my lecturing. Um, let me turn a little bit to uh, the book and say that we live in a uh, moment of fast or instant education policy making. And this is perhaps a moment of anti-history. In other words, policy making is proceeding with a, without a sense of historical context and a much diminished, if not entirely absent, absent notion of democratic politics and policy making. But Peter's book, interestingly, the historical account that he provides of a century and more ago holds methodological and theoretical lessons for understanding the current moment. Because you may think that the current moment is so radically different from 100 years ago that there are no historical lessons to be learned for understanding. Peter. Uh, Peter's methodology is based on a range of archival sources across many continents and across many archives in South Africa about what in the colonial in colonial terms in the early 20th century is called the development era. And that development era already kind of signals a phase in which colonial policy had moved into a particular kind of period had brought into view particular kinds of discourses that constituted what that developmentalism in colonial education amounted to. And we have to be careful to understand the influences so that we are able to map them appropriately. Because Peter is uh, concerned to explore the significance of historical research to understand the rhetoric and the reality of policy production, a concern that in personal terms always occupied Peter's mind uh, at least uh, my exposure to him over two decades. And therefore, his book is an account of the networks, the exchanges, the people, the relations among a range of private and public and voluntary organizations that produce the regulative policy discourses of colonial education. And as I said, we can learn much from his methodology. Nowadays, I read texts to understand methodologically I think um, uh, Sean also uh, alluded to this methodologically. What is the historian, what is the scholar doing to constitute, to construct the story? Um, where in lies a lot of many lessons for how we ought to proceed. The period under review as a result is given fascinating multidimensionality. The early 20th century is the period where the colonial state moves closer to its colonial ending. It is also the period when the imperial mind shifts to incorporate the latest science of the period, coming under the influence of social welfareism and scientific advisors um, and that have influences on policy discourse. And Azim, for example, Azim, in his thesis, pick up on these, this multidimensional there's a mention, mentionality that plays itself out in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s uh, um, in uh, his analysis of a correctional institution for young people in uh, uh, that constituted education policy discourse and welfareism in colored communities. I am very interested to understand, Peter, um, how you worked with sensitivity and context and nuance with the people whom you were uh, um, analyzing at the center of your, of your, of your book. Scientists, Malinowski, et cetera, et cetera. Educationists, Loran, Clark, Murray. Uh, Oldham, whom I would have read as a policy interpreter, network interpreter, near being all these different influences together. But you take care not to, dis to, to, to collapse 
the raison d'etre of the educationists into the raison d'etre of the, of the anthropologists into the raison d'etre of the colonial ones. To so hold these things up and to show how they come together out of the particular contingency of the moment in order to give historical specificity the kind of dynamics that constituted a particular kind of discourse. Colonial education in the way the decolonial moment has uh, has uh, informed the readings by students and unreflective academics is, re is read as one, universally terrible. What you're arguing is not that you want to get away from that moral judgment, but what you're saying is let's suspend that moral judgment, not because we don't believe that something bad happened, but that moral judgment often gets into the way of the nuanced analysis. And if, if there's one thing that your book teaches us, is that moralizing is not an excuse for historical understanding that with nuance and so on. This book allows one conclusion to understand how the arbitrary discourse of colonial subjugation and racial oppression changed and took on new grammars of human degradation and, uh, and repression. At the very moment, when physical or, or kind of ge or, you know, decolonization ended in the 1950s, all across Africa, later on in South Africa, 1990s, at the moment when coloniality became invisible, but still fundamentally framed our existences. Histo historicizing the historical task is to expose the nuance of that invisibility, to make it visible. To be able to for us to get a handle of understanding on how of how education policy discourse is constructed, constrained, and functions in the world that we live in. It was a tour de force, uh, Peter. I enjoyed reading it very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to respond to it. Thank you, thank you, Aslam. Um, um, at some point, we're going to have to come back to Peter and to ask him to, to in a sense, engage with, with the, the two sets of comments. Um, in a minute. As I was reading the book, um, I also saw it as an illustration of history itself, that the constructedness to all of this, it finds its way to an explanation um, through the life of Peter's writing, through the life of his thought processes, through the way he engaged with different elements. You could see Peter walk the path through the various chapters and use that as a way of telling us the story that he himself had, ex had experienced. So for me, that was another insight I felt that I took out of the book that I'd like to always share with my students, that um, engaging with history is not, is not uh, looking at something that is outside of yourself but it's how you uh, it's about it's a story about how you engage with with yourself and and the stories you're telling um and allowing other people to see it um and i think that that is to me if i may say that peter your greatest strength is that when i uh, joined uct for instance in the 1980s um the first article i read was the the one on fred clark and people will say, uh, uh, today they'll say, why would you mention the article on Fred Clark? But the story of Fred Clark allowed me to understand the history of Cape, uh, Cape Town at the time and the history of UCT at the time and gave me an <coughs> insight in how people operate at UCT at that moment. And so for that moment, at least, through the eyes of Fred Clark and through uh, the eyes of Peter Calloway, I was able to engage historically with a key a key history of UCT itself. And I think that's what I always tell my students. And I think hopefully way into the future, um, our students will tell their students about how to think about history and the writing of history. Um, two questions that came out of um, so far, if I may go, Peter, I'm not sure if you'd like to say something first before I go to questions um, from the audience. Um, wow. Well. <laughs> I'm a bit uh, overwhelmed by all that. Um, thank you. Uh, what else can I say? Thank you. Um, 
one does what one does, you know. I mean, it just comes out somehow or other. You just uh, and uh, I'm, I, I'm. It's just so wonderful to 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 have people like Aslam, you, and Azim to to carry carry the the the, the torch forward. You know, um, uh, uh, it's a great compliment. I suppose just commenting on on a couple of those things. I mean, uh, what comes out from what you said is. <clears throat> The many biographies that cross over in this thing. I mean, I got in, absorbed in so many of these people. Um, I mean, uh, as, 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 as you said, the um, person, you know. And what's even more extraordinary, and this is the point I wanted to make, is that the crossover is between Westermann in Berlin and London and Mutai in Berlin, here in the Eastern Cape, because Mutai's biography is published in 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 Westermann's biography of 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 black educationalists in Berlin in 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 the thirties. I mean, how extraordinary is that? Why? Because Westermann's a linguist, and 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 and. Uh, and is it at, at Lovedale Forte as in, uh, and, and meets Mkai and, 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 and this, I mean, I don't know this, but it can only be, they must have met and uh, that's how he got published in Germany. So <laughs> extraordinary. And the other one is uh, Ntunkulu um, 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 has a mixed relationship with Charles Loram, but this gets him to Yale and it gets him into the big policy world to see a bigger, wider world. Uh, whether it does him any good or not, it's another story because he winds up as an exile or as a voluntary exile in Canada, uh, which is where I interviewed him. But, you know, Lorem, um, and, and where, where does that come from? Because uh, Lorem was the chief inspector of native education in Natal, and then he recruited um, 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 to go to, um, uh, to, 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 to get to, to, to Lovedale and so on. So, and the other person you mentioned is who fascinates me endlessly is, is Oldham, the head of the uh, International Missionary Commission. Extraordinary man, extraordinary man, uh, who, who's, who's a networker par excellence. Uh, unfortunately, nobody's ever written about him in, in education. I don't understand why, but they've never written about it. So, so just a couple of these. I mean, through people like that, you have such a... And of course, the other person I've... Uh, uh, there's no time to talk about now is this guy, Fred Murray. Uh, Fred... Uh, uh, um, Victor Murray, who I'm trying to write about, but it's very difficult. So anyway, fascinating people. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think we've got some questions uh, from the audience. Um, if I can just uh, read them out, uh, I've got two questions for now. Um, the first question is, to what extent, if at all, does the book look at how colonial education has helped to reinforce colonial gender stereotypes that persist today. And then the second question from Shifa Desai um, asks, how can colonial solutions be facilitated in teacher education today? Uh, perhaps if we start with those questions and then we open up to the audience itself um, and hopefully get some people to speak. Yeah. Look, the gender issue is a really interesting one. And again, a lot of people, this completely uh, astounds me. And the cupboard behind me, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a box full of stuff that I will one day get to, I hope. And, and that is about the issue of gender, the, what was called the education of women and girls in Africa. And in fact, there were at least two commissions, if not three, um, of the British colonial office um, on that issue in the 1930s. 
And also, um, I think you, you, the League of Nations also had some kind of commission on it. And so it wasn't as if this was an issue that nobody was looking at. Um, um, there's not a lot written about it, but um, maybe an explanation of uh, an exploration of that stuff uh, could, in fact, throw all sorts of light on present day issues, gender issues, and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, a lot of that literature is about of, of that time. It's, 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 it's about domesticating women. It's about um, girls being taught to be good women. Yeah. A lot of it is about that kind of stuff. And it's in a mission context of a quite old fashioned mission kind of context of, in other words, women to be obedient and to do what they're supposed to do and to be domestic and whatever those bring up children and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of it. And they're big, they're big uh, formal commissions of inquiry into this, that to the best of my knowledge have only been touched on. So it's not as if it's ignored. It's just that it's, <clears throat> I mean, girls schooling in the Eastern Cape in the, in the late 19th century, before the time we're talking about, there, there are a good number of girls schools and girls are doing pretty well in, in the, in, not so much at high school. Uh, um, but again, it's one of those things that just fascinate me. I mean, why don't people work on these things? You know, it's the most obvious kind of topic. There's all that stuff lying there in the archives here in Cape Town on those things, and and and, and they're not explored. I don't understand really about colonial solutions to educational teaching. No, Peter, I guess sorry. I understood that's what Peter. Sorry. Yeah, it's actually decolonial. Decolonial solutions to teaching. My apologies. Decolonial solutions to, to teach. How can decolonial solutions be facilitated in teacher education today? Sorry, I, I really don't understand. I don't understand. I still don't well, maybe we should ask the, 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 the person asking the question, Shifa? I don't. I don't. Yeah. Shifa? Yes. Right. I was asking the, the person that asked the question, Shifa, uh, if you can unmute yourself, Shifa. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Hi, well, thank you so much for a very lively discussion. I'm coming in from Somaliland, so uh, the sound <laughs> might be a little bit vague. No, can hear you perfectly. Okay, yes. So here in, in Somaliland, the issues are very much about the global south and decolon decolonizing education here, which is very topical. And by that they mean what are the kinds of um, institutionalized methods, methodologies that teachers are still employing, borrowed from colonial times. So it's in that context that I was asking, what are the things that are still left over from colonial education that we are currently still employing yeah. unconsciously or consciously yeah. and how can we go about decolonizing our teaching methods yeah does that make clearer yeah very very, very interesting question chief very interesting um uh yes i mean uh, the the, the the, this is certainly something that concerned educationalists in the time that I'm talking about. Um, the, the critique of what was seen to be the old fashioned missionary method, which was based on pedagogies that had evolved in, in, in Europe and so of teacher centered you know, the teacher telling and the students sitting still and listening, that, or writing, or that sort of stuff, you know. So a lot of the critique in the 1930s of missionary education, that it was seen to be like that. It was seen to be both uh, over determined by religion, so it needed to be secularized, but also authority figures 
uh, they, in other words, knowledge was to be handed down in the classroom. That was what happened. And kids would soak it up, basically. Yeah. Now, this is one of the big debates of the, of the interwar period, is the progressive education debate coming out of initially America, which said, nonsense, that's not the way that education should be. It should be child-centered. We should, we should construct the children's education around things the kids know, the known to the unknown. Uh, in, in, and, 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 and the whole progressive educational issue. Now, I mean, <laughs> one could go on for an hour about this. The fact of the matter is that, well, and, and the, the, the adapted education issue of the adapted curriculum and adapted methodologies that we were talking about earlier was essentially addressed at that. You know, don't bring in outside knowledge from somewhere else. Deal, get kids to engage with the knowledge in front that they already know in front of them, in their village, in their culture, in their language. The problem is that those things don't always work for, for reasons which, I mean, one can't go into here. The fact is that anybody who has in, in the South African context, that was what people were to told by about the apartheid education. You know, go for your own knowledge. Don't don't get messed up and detribalized by foreign by foreign European education. People said, "No, thank you very much. I'll have the I'll have the golden rule thing that you also have. In other words, the same kind of education that you have in England or for whites in South Africa. That's what we want." So I'm only half answering your question, but, but I think that the issue is there. Your issue is a correct one. But how you persuade people to go for progressive, te progressive methodologies when in fact the whole educational systems that we live as part of desire outcomes, not processes. I'm sorry, you, you, know, you, you pass the exam, you've got to get results, etc. The whole exam system um, militates against <coughs> progressive methodologies. And you only have to read wonderful stuff by people like David Labory in America, where he talks about the romantic dream that an American educationalist had about progressive education that it that yes they all believe all the teachers believed in it but that's not what they did <laughs> they went for the exam focused mark orientated type of curriculum um which was teacher centered i don't know shifter does that get anywhere i'm not sure yes thank you very much that's excellent okay thank you shifter. Uh, i think azim i've got another question you do. Shifa, if I could ask Yusuf Gabru to, to ask to, to ask a question quickly and then we'll come back to your question. Sure. If you don't mind? Okay, thanks. Yusuf? I think you may be muted, Yusuf. Yusuf, I, I, I see your mic is off, but I can't, we can't hear you. We're not, we're not hearing you, Yusuf. I'm not sure how we resolve this. Um, Yusuf, I think you have a mic problem. Uh, colleagues, uh, can you can you hear Yusuf? No. No. Okay. Um, Yusuf, let's try to solve that. In the meantime, uh, Shifa, you can ask your question. And I'll just try to resolve this on the side, and then just after Shifa, Crane's got a question as well. Thank you, Azim. So I have another question, uh, if you don't mind. What lessons does uh, well does Peter's book hold as a guide for other regions in the global South? For other religions. No, other, religions. 
Sorry, is that what you said? For other religions? No, other regions. Other regions. Oh, region. oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> look, it, it, it mainly focuses on um, East Africa, Southern Africa. I mean, I, I, I did very little on West Africa just because of the scope of it all, you know. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, what I think what I'm trying to do, Shifa, is provide, hopefully, some kind of um, framework that will allow people to look at specific spaces and 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 try to work on those spaces with the same with with the same kind of framework. I think that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm, I, it's impossible to write a comprehensive history of education in every corner of Africa. It's just impossible. You can't even do that in South Africa, let alone across the continent. So I think uh, I'm afraid my answer is a vague one once again. I think that, uh, you know, I would hope that out of having a look at the book or having a look at some of the indicators, um, maybe questions would arise, and then we could end. We could enter into some kind of discussion about that. I mean, that is my ideal. You know? We we have had uh, two workshops in Cape Town um, in the last few years. One of which is published about colonial education in Africa, and where we've tried to bring people like yourself together into one spot to have just these kinds of conversations. I'm not sure whether we will ever do that again, but that 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 was an initiative aimed at just what you're talking about, getting kind of you know people with 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 diverse contextual experiences into the same place to talk about history and policy, as it were. I mean, it's not that I'm saying at all that if you know the history, you'll get the policy right. You know, this is just not, it, it's not as simple as that at all, you know. Um, uh, but but I could imagine that uh, Somalia, Eritrea, we had students from Eritrea at, at, in Cape Town uh, at the U University of Western Cape at one stage, a, 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 a bunch of students who came to do master's degrees. And we found that there was amazing kind of, link-ups between the problems they were facing and what we were facing in the 1990s in South Africa. So, so you know, if one has those choices, maybe, uh, you know, those solutions will arise. I, but thank you for that. Thank you, Shifa. Thank you, Peter. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? Um, uh, Yusuf has indicated that he, he, he's not going to ask a question. Um, anyone would like to, any of our, of our colleagues on the, in, the, in the room would like to say something other than a question? I don't see any, any questions or any hands. Um, The one thing that online has taught us, though, is that we need to be patient uh, and allow questions to, uh, like in the classroom, allow the questions to, to emerge out of the out of the space. Um, in previous times, we could we could um, just point to somebody and ask a question, <laughs> uh, but this is not a classroom. <laughs> this is not teacher-centered classrooms, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, Look, the, um, somebody's asking, um, Rob. Rob, you can go ahead. We can't hear you, Rob. This might be a common thing. Um, that's tied to our system that we have because it doesn't seem as our colleagues can speak. Uh, Rob, were you going to ask something? His mic's off as well. You know, I, I've seen yeah. three hands up so far. <laughs> 
um, none of which were real hands. So I, I must apologize, Rob, if, if um, you were not asking a question. Um, look, uh, the, the thing for me, if I may say this, Peter, um, uh, as, a, as a, um, a person that uses your work regularly in my classroom, um, and, and to me, the book uh, is, is a critical book, if I'm going to punt it in a big way. Um, it's a critical book um, that will stand the test of time as much as uh, education and apartheid was important in the 1980s. This book is important for the 2020s. Uh, and the reason for it, it's not only about the, the, um, the text that it covers, but it's about the structure and how the argument is made. And I think it's crucial that we, that we engage with the book uh, at, that, at that level. What, what do we learn in this moment um, from the book and from the teaching of history? Because history and the teaching of history of education in our classrooms are, are enormously problematic at the moment. Um, and um, what the book helps us with, it gives us something to work with with students in the classroom. And so that's the first thing I'd like to say, thank you for giving us something to work with moving forward. The second thing that the book does is it, it reminds us that as we have these contemporary discussions about decoloniality and about the complexities of African history and about the complexities of the colonial world, that we have also ways of engaging with, the, with those debates um, through books like this through books that take um, missionary agency seriously, that the, the books that take, that a book that takes uh, humanitarian agency seriously, the, the issues about scientific experts, African agents, um, and the way it shows the, uh, the unfolding of a, or the growing of an African agent and how that plays into the history. Seminal moments of methodology that we can use as we go moving forward into working with students uh, in, in the contemporary moment. My, my challenge at the moment for, for my students is that they tend to focus on the current moment in terms of education policy without really thinking through where did this come from. So currently we're having a big debate about philanthropy. We're having a big debate about the private, private and public. And we don't go back to what the links are to missionaries. connect the two that's what the book brings to us it brings us the that uh, opportunity to connect the past to the present not in terms of the past and the present in that old age about we understand mm -hmm. the present through the past but rather that these debates are not new no. that these no. debates have no. been discussed before that no. these no. debates have been contested before and that we can learn from those debates and the contestations around it yeah I, I took the moment to say that mainly just to fill up the space so that we can have uh, people like Rob ask questions in the... Now what about in, Crane? You said Crane was around there somewhere. I guess he was. Um, if I can just, Peter, if I can uh, um, read out uh, Rob's question. Um, yeah. Rob always asks difficult questions, so he says that it is a difficult question. Colonial education is generally, generally regarded as a bad thing, something we don't want, that we need to get rid of. But I think your book is suggesting that we are tied to colonial education, and whether we like it or not, and that there are good things about it, and that these good things are easily disregarded in the decolonial moment. Yeah. Will you respond to that? <clears throat> Will I get executed? Is it, is it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that's that's an question yeah i think you know i mean if you'd ask that question i uh, just to be really crude if you'd ask that question of nelson mandela i'm sure he would have said it was good and bad you know um and, and I suppose um, uh, that's my answer too. It depends what you're talking about. I mean, the fact of the matter is that however harsh it was, however um, 
and inhuman it was in many ways. Um, one of the things about colonial education, even into the 1930s, although probably more so at an earlier period, was that it was just based on what went on in British public schools, where there was harsh discipline. It was all top-down teachers stuffing Latin into kids, and Greek into kids and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's one of the things somebody touched on, I think Sean touched on earlier, was that the, 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 the modes of education or the discourse of education or the practices of education in places like Britain and America were slowly changing in the time that we're talking about. And so was the education in the, in, in, the, in the colonial context. So this is always the problem is what was going on in those mission schools? I mean, it's one of the questions I remember Andrew Patterson raising years ago. You know, we have no, little sense of what was actually happening in those schools. I mean, talking about the high schools now, not talking about the primary school, we're talking about the high schools. Um, what actually went on in there? The records are very, very slim to give us any kind of sense of that. Um, so I don't know, you know, yes, it was good and bad, I suppose. Um, a bad thing, I don't know. I mean, are schools a bad thing anyway? There was a time when we used to teach, I seem to remember in the 70s, that schools were all about... Um, apparatuses of control and whatever, you know, that, that, that they were all about getting kids off the streets and discipline. <laughs> it's not as simple as that. It's, you know, nothing is as simple as them. So I don't, I, I don't know, Rob. I, uh, I, I don't know the answer. I, I, I would say good and bad, depending on where, when, how, who you are, whatever, you know. I, I can't imagine that many kids who went to, to uh, mission schools had a, a fun time. But then I didn't either. I hated every part of school. So, I, you know, so you know, what I was doing, training teachers the rest of my life, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Peter. I mean, I, I think Aslam made, makes a comment in the in the chat that I think sometimes um, we need to park uh, good and bad moral logics um, because of, of, of education under apartheid. Yeah. Um, I would say yeah. I had a fantastic time having having yeah. grown up in Livingston and Porsche. But I can also tell you that I hated the moment of, of education yeah. at that in, in that space. Okay. So, so it's it's a subjective thing. I I have oh, to learn. Yeah. I le learn to love, uh, learn to love the moment of learning, but that yeah. doesn't mean I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so this this moral logic is is kind of it's what it's the question that you ask. Um, yeah. So, um, I think I mean yeah. I, I think uh, uh, um, Rob's follow up question was that. Um, uh, your book, uh, Apartheid in Education, was a total critique of apartheid education. Um, and so, in a sense, how do you how do you fit in that alongside um, what you were speaking about earlier? Yeah, um, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think, um, doesn't that just prove the point in a way that I'm, that I'm trying to make in another context that that was an intervention into a particular space when apartheid and education were, were at a high point. And all of us who were part of that community were trying to find ways of launching some kind of attack on it, basically. Yeah. So uh, we were not looking for good sides. You know, I mean, I knew schools in Soweto in the 1970s where good education was going on. You know, I mean, I, I was going there on teaching practice and stuff. So, you know, I had, there, was, there were good spaces. And I sometimes wonder, quite honestly, because there was a quality of teacher in those schools that 
uh, might be hard to find today because those teachers didn't have anywhere else to go. They were graduates of Forte or the or Turf Loop or whatever, but there was nowhere for them to go in the 1970s. So you had quality teachers who, in the in, as time went by, all drifted off into the private sector and that kind of stuff. So, so in a way, even that kind of critique of apartheid in education was was fragile. They were they were they were they, 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 it, you couldn't universalize. And I suppose maybe that's the problem uh, now. So, and also we were operating out of a particular kind of political economy model there in apartheid and education, which was very strong at that stage in terms of an analysis of South African society, a class analysis and all that. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's partly true, but none of that is as strong as it was then. Now, it's, it, it is not the same reason. Sorry, uh, enough. No, absolutely. We have one last question, Pete, uh, Peter. Um, we, I must tell the audience this. We had a discussion earlier about how long we were going to, uh, to do this. And we said perhaps one and a half hours is too long. Yeah. Yeah. We've now gone on for one and a half hours. Yeah. So it's not too long. Yeah. Um, and I think we're having, uh, we're having uh, questions, still questions come in. So if I could take uh, um, Ronald's question, uh, I must apologize, Ronald. I can't read. I'm, I'm getting old. So I'm going to, I, I copied it over to, to, uh, to a Word document. So let me read it from a different document. Um, Ronald says, I recently read an article by Oldsbrook that links adaptive education to the rise of positivism in social sciences, which allowed for the development of instrumental discourses of what works while ignoring questions of for whom by depoliticizing education. It also allows colonial legacies to continue invisibly. Would you agree? Yeah. I'm not sure I totally understand, but um, if if this is helpful, I mean, I think I think um, she's making a similar point to the one that I made when I was reading out the 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 piece from um, from uh, Victor Murray. Which is on page one fifty four, if, if for, for 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 purposes, um, Victor Murray is saying something like that. I think that you know, adapted education, i.e., progressive education, i.e., um, education that puts the child, the community, the whatever at the center of the of the picture, um, does so rhetorically in the interests of the student um, and the child in terms of progressive educational ideology etc but in fact what what I, I hope i'm making myself clear what uh, murray is saying is it does exactly the opposite it actually cuts that child off from the bigger wider modern world which that child needs to em embrace and engage with if if the education is going to be of any use so 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 maybe Ronel, that 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 is the same point I, I i'm not sure that it's the same point but but certainly adapted education or industrial education or it's got all sorts of names is a form of progressive education and i indicated earlier that people like david labery have 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 demolished the idea that progressive education in America, let alone here, was the what came out top in the discourses of the middle of the 20th century. It wasn't that that came out. It was the managerial model that came out at the top, and that's what we've got. We've got the managerial model that, and and, and so is most most people. So. So I think Renell's right. I, I, I think so. That, that adaptation flies under a banner of emancipation. But in fact, in the odd realities of the world, that the not how it works out. Chapter two about the new economic, uh, new education fellowship. I think. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Peter.
Um, Jean asked if you could say something about chapter four, uh, science and policy in relation to that, I suppose. Well, the, the chapter four is the one on anthropology, yes? On science, oh, so I think she's meaning the science and policy one. Yeah. Well, that's all about anthropology, that one. Okay. Uh, about the fact that uh, somebody mentioned Malinowski earlier. Malinowski um, was the professor of anthropology at London School of Economics. And he, with the collaboration of Oldham at the, at the International Missionary Council, managed to get large amounts of funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation to, for, to promote research in Africa in anthropology. And uh, in other words, bringing science to policy, that was the whole kind of way in which it was sold, which is why those foundations bought into it. Phelps Stokes first, and then later on Rockefeller, and later on Carnegie. Carnegie uh, funded the South African Institute of Race Relations in South Africa. So that they were they were all into engaging with um, hum, 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 humanitarian um, uh, policy initiatives um, uh, at that stage, but the. Sorry, I lost it. Sorry, where, where was I? What, what, what was the question again? The, the, the chapter on science and policy. Oh, yes, right, 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 right. 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 Yeah. And, and so, so, so anthropology was seen as one of the ways th through a thing called culture contact, whatever the hell that was, it was Malinowski's word that was used, is that, is that, uh, anthropology, more research on anthropology would in fact enable the colonial rulers to rule more efficiently or more justly or whatever that you had to put it. Um, that was the way Malinowski and others sold anthropology, i.e. science. The fact of the matter is that very little of the research that was done, barring perhaps Godfrey Wilson's, but most of the other researchers who, who, who were part of that program did a kind of structuralist an anthropology that had absolutely nothing to do with social change at all. They never looked at missionaries and what they were doing. They simply looked at the tribe and looked back a, a, as it was, kind of static entity there and try, charted, which, you know, it was a massive job to do but they didn't engage with social change. And, 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 and both the critics and the colonial officials got fed up with all that because they thought they were letting these guys into the field in order to help them govern the natives more effectively. And that didn't, none of it worked out like that. So science, although it provided a kind of, uh, um, prospective solution to the, to, the, to the solutions of colonial society. It never did, in fact. It, it, none of the anthropology that those guys produced, except perhaps Monica Wilson to some extent, or, and a couple of others, but most of them didn't produce anything that looked like a solution to the colonial problem. So, the, so uh, even Loram, who was at Yale, uh, selling himself as an expert in race relations, none of it went anywhere. So uh, 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 they all wound back with a model of adapted communities, rural communities, that sort of stuff, which even Loram himself had to admit in the end that um, it was an impossible model to expect Native Americans to stay in their reservations, etc in some kind of time warp of culture and language and stuff. Was, this is a ridiculous idea. Even Laura had to admit it in the end, that this was a stupid idea. You know, you couldn't. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Peter. Um, um, I have one last, I'm, I'm not sure how, how people feel. Um, should we go on and, and add more questions or do we close at some point? <laughs> 
Uh, are you, are, if everybody's okay with just continuing, then I'll just until the questions run out. That's uh, it. Yeah, Yale asked a question. Um, she's sitting in a car. Hi, Yale. Uh, good afternoon, Yale. Um, Hello, Yale. Would you like to speak, or shall I ask the question for you? Okay. I think she's in a in a in a car listening to the conversation. So I'll read the question. It is, uh, what is the status of the discipline? That being uh, history of education in teacher education today. Oh. Um, the context of a question is that students need to understand the discipline in order to ask the right questions. But if it's <laughs> not taught, how would they be able to use it? <laughs> oh, Yale, it's so wonderful. You always hit it right on the nail. <laughs> Well, we all know the answer to that question is that nobody even teaches history of education anymore. So, you know, the, the, and there's a, there is a reason for that, that a lot of what his, was taught of history of education in the old days was just quite literally crap, basically. It was, it was, it was chronological, great man, all that sort of stuff, which didn't, in, in, unless you were absolutely inside the, the discipline you have any idea where this went or what did that to do with anything i can remember being taught history of education like that at uct and at the institute of education you know that was it was actually useless stuff so i think that's part of the problem but the other side of of yale's uh, question of course i agree with entirely is that how the hell will you come to understand the nature of policy or the way policy is embedded in politics and economics. How will you do that unless you study from that angle? And the other question that's embedded in Yale's thing, of course, and I have every sympathy with that too, is that how do you do this unless you've had an undergraduate training or a graduate training in, in history? It, 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 it's very hard to do that. And to be quite frank, when I look around the country, uh, and I did so a little recently, I, I despair at, in the name of modernizing the curriculum, most history departments don't seem to teach the sorts of things anymore that I would have thought were necessary to do the kind of work I've done in this book. Because, you know, do they teach the history of the pre the interwar years? Do they teach the history of fascism? Do they teach the history of the of the nineteenth century and the, and, the, and the industrial revolution? If you don't do that, you haven't got a background to start on this stuff. So, uh, you know, I think Yale's question is a very very good one, and I don't. I mean, it's added to that is the fact that education departments or schools of education don't seem to think this is necessary. To, 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 to find people to teach this. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, we're a tiny band. And it's not just here. It's, we, we mustn't think it's just something that's happening here. It's, it's, it's happening around the world. Absolutely. So thanks, Jan. Okay, Aslam and Sean, would you like to say some final words? Sean. Yeah, there we go. Uh, no, I don't think I would like to say anymore. I mean, it's been a, a, a very, uh, a very good. I mean, honestly, to be for a an event like this to go on, I think without any feeling of strain or artificiality for what nearly one and three quarter hours is remarkable, and I think that's a a tribute to the book, a tribute to Pete's presentation, a tribute to his sort of honesty, you know, what what do we know? What can we know? Uh, can I say something useful? That's a very good starting point. So I don't think I'm going to add much more than that. It was, a, I, I really enjoyed this. I've been sitting here enjoying it immensely and not least seeing these old friends and colleagues. Uh, <laughs> All of them. From, <laughs> from the past and the future too. So thanks very much. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, uh, Aslam. Thanks, Azim. And thanks everybody who, uh, not that it's up to me to thank people, but it's it's been nice seeing these names down the side of the screen, uh, old friends. So it's been a very, very good experience. Thanks a lot. Bye from me. Thank you.
Thank you, Azim. Um, I experienced this entire webinar as a bit of a poignant and nostalgic moment. But uh, when I heard uh, that Peter is still pursuing his research and writing, I persuaded myself not to feel um, as emotionally taken in as I originally did at the beginning. So Peter has been a, an example and an inspiration and long may you be with us, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you, Aslam. Uh, look, um, I, I say to my boys the other day, um, um, who are also trying to do some kind of work or other, said, if I continue to work like Peter's worked until the age of 80, then I would have fulfilled my dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, you are, you are inspiration in the work that you do. Um, and, and in this work, I mean, again, I'll put the book out there. Um, long may it live in the, in the hands of our students and in the minds of our students. Um, and it's, and, and in, in, in closing on, on this, it's not about Peter Calloway and, and his contribution to their thinking and their work, but how you change their thinking as you, as they work with your work. I think that's the most important thing, how you contribute, how they, when they, uh, I still have this experience every, every now and then when I have my students over for supper and, um, there's a friend over, a, a, a colleague, and they say, this is that person. And, they, and they, they, they gush with all this enthusiasm about this excitement. You know, that moment of knowing that, that the knowledge is tied to a human being and that all of us in this room have contributed in some kind of way to this discussion. I think that's important for us to hold. Um, so while we're being nostalgic about the people in the room, um, I think um, we're also nostalgic about all the students that read the works of people in this room mm -hmm. and of themselves and, and then change the historical moment in which we live. I think that that's the most important thing. History of education is not about, about the history of what has happened, but what we, what we use it for in charting a way forward. And I, and I think that's the, the value of this book. And so I'd like to perhaps end off in that way by saying a huge, huge thank you to African Sun Media um, for publishing, uh, uh, locally publishing this book. Because without them doing that, uh, most of our students and most of our colleagues would not necessarily buy the book because it would be too expensive. Yeah. So thank you, African Sun Media, for making sure that the book is used in the way that it was meant to be used. Um, so um, maybe perhaps that's a, a good way of ending off. Mm -hmm. Not only launching, but thanking the publisher that has launched the book um, in, with, uh, without whose contribution, uh, we would not be able to have this event today. Um, any, any last words, Peter, and then we can close. Yes, just thank you to everybody. That's all, thank you. I mean, uh... Uh, beyond all my expectations and uh, um, thank goodness a, a, a project um, come to fulfillment uh, and uh, to have all of you there that's uh, a real blessing so thank you all thank you Peter thank you Aslam thank you Sean uh, that's the last two people I need to thank for for your contributions today and more importantly Peter thank you for the work that you do and that you will continue to do long Thanks, Azim. go well everyone thank you bye-bye